Hi, Chad. My name is James Gregg. Um, I'm the presenter today. I wonder if you'd just like to introduce yourself and um, maybe everybody else, and then we can get going. Sure. Yeah, I know a few more will probably come a little bit late, but um, my name's sure. Chad. I'm I am the owner, founder of a company called Rhubarb Media in Barrie, Ontario for about 14, going on 15 years. And we are good friends with Georgian Copy and Printers and Elliot tasked us to um, kind of create some energy around the Airdesk Press and webinars is one of, those, one of those items. So we're pretty excited to learn how to CMY k plus design so thanks for having us james cool thank you chad we've got quite a lot of people on the call to today so i'm um gonna try and save bandwidth and a little bit of time by not uh, showing my a video so as it's top of the hour i'll crack on and we can see how it goes so good day all and on behalf of the zimmet group and the xerox welcome to Designing Beyond CMYK, Xerox Xerox Production Press. As you've heard, my name is James Gregg, and you'll tell from my accent that um, we have to save the bandwidth across the Atlantic to today. And I'll be your host for this session. And I'm delighted today to be joined by Bailey Kennedy. Hi, Bailey. Hi, good morning, everyone. Afternoon. Thank you. And also by Nikki, Nikki Kruger, I think maybe coming in as well. Hi, Nikki. Hi, James. Hello, everyone. Hello. Good morning. So we'll be, thanks very much, Nikki. Thank you, Bailey. So we'll be sharing, um, well, I say we, that's a role we, uh, Bailey will particularly be sharing her design insights and experience, I guess, gathered over the last four or five years now, Bailey, on designing for the Xerox, Xerox Iridesk production press. Just let everybody know who's on the call that we are recording the session and there will be an email that comes out to all the attendees from our project manager, Ron Buckman, and there'll be a link to the recording. So if you wish to share this to any of your colleagues or friends or partners um, who missed today or to review, please feel free to do so. The link will also have a number of other assets, uh, some further videos, some downloadable assets we'll refer to as we go through. I said we are recording the session, um, which is great. Please feel free to ask any questions you can, either straight away verbally if you're not on mute, or if you're on mute, or if we get background noise, please use the chat pod and we'll do our best to answer any questions directly. Anything that we have to take away, we'll get Xerox or one of our one of their representatives to respond. So, with that said, let's get going. As we've alluded to, this session is very much around the design side. So we're going to focus on the creative inspiration behind the designs and how to actually prepare them, how we prepared them, and lots of hints and tips. So hopefully we're going to demystify some of the speciality techniques that come up when you move from a CMYK a four color world to a five and a six color world, and very much looking at some of our lessons learned. We spent some years um, doing some great work, but also some, some, to be honest with you, some mistakes. We could have done things better. So we'll share those with you. And Bay will be going through us with us some how-to steps uh, in InDesign, in Photoshop, and on Illustrator of how we achieve the specific techniques that we've ended up with. And we'll be going through some of the um, guidelines that we've evolved. And that will set the stage for any additional support that you may feel is needed either from Xerox or from ourselves. So, as I've said, we're going to focus on the design rather than individual troubleshooting your files. Um, and we're going to focus again on the design rather than those technical operator type technology issues. So if anything comes up, any specific questions you have around the technology, please feel free to ask. And we'll do our best to answer. But we're going to focus as much as we can on the design side. So what are we going to do today? 
we'll kick off just very quickly about our story, our background, and then we're going to go through a series of applications we developed and how we evolved our way of thinking as we move from a CMYK four color world to a CMYK plus world. So new ways of thinking. And then we'll illustrate those with some step-by-step -step design techniques. How do we actually apply the techniques we talk about in the application itself and why we did that? What we're looking for all the time. Um, and also again, share with you some of the things probably best to avoid. We'll, as we go through, we'll also be sharing with you some of the best practice, some of the guidelines that we've developed that really make it work for us. Now, these are guidelines rather than rules, so you're free to um, break them. In fact, we'll break them occasionally. But one of the key takeaways is communication. How do we communicate the design intent and the setup of the press? And how do we proof for this? So we, we will be going through that. And you'll see we will um, hopefully make things a little bit quicker for you as you develop your designs. Any questions or queries so far, or are we on the right tracks of this afternoon's session or this morning session for you guys? That's good, James. Thanks. Cool. Thank you. That's great. So, brief introduction to ourselves. So, myself, Bailey, and Nikki are from the Zimmet Group, who are not part of Xerox, but we were very lucky to be involved from the beginning. In fact, about a year before the launch of this product with Xerox, from a technical side, from the product launch side, and have also developed all of the marketing materials, sort of the tools, the collaterals that you see have come out of our group. Also, we've been involved internally with Xerox in their sales and analyst training. So it's been great for us. And I said, we've learned a lot. We've learned a great deal. Um, what to avoid, what to, what to do. We also do some work with the other CMYK Plus products, the iGen 5 with extended gamut, the legacy color press product you may have used or come across, and the smaller CMYK Plus, adaptive CMYK Plus products. So it's given us a good insight into how this works and what works and what doesn't. And one of the things, just to share with you straight away, that I discovered as we started this and that we tried to, to focus on is that less is often more. When we first started this, I thought, oh, it's got to be gold. Let's add lots of gold. Let's get some really rich colors. And all we found out, found out about that is it really blocks everything up. And as we developed, you'll see, we've tried to lighten everything up, tried to go down the principle of less is often more. And we'll come back to that a few times. I don't know yourself, Bailey, um, what, are, what are the things that you've I think you've learned probably over the last couple of years working with this product. Um, that when we started out, we really wanted to uh, add gold to everything that was already gold in our imagery. Um, and we kind of learned that, um, like you were saying, less is more. We uh, figured out that we didn't want to add um, gold to like gold watches or gold clothing or jewelry um, or stuff that was already gold in our um, imagery and added it more as like accent um graphics and text to kind of complement what was already going on in our photographs because it kind of plugs it up and makes it muddy it doesn't really enhance the shine um <laughs> so we discovered that as a what not to <laughs> yeah that's that's really true I, well, well again thanks Bailey for that that's i remember some stuff that we've all worked on that really couldn't work out why it wasn't looking what we expected it to look like and we'll share some of those with you and as we go through we'll point out some 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 areas to avoid and areas to emphasize thanks bailey so what is it that really is so special about the press and so this is not a technical class it's a design class but one of the things we've learned as well is is understanding what happens in the press to some extent really helps you take advantage of it one of the key unique features of the press is that you can decide as a designer to put specialty colors over or under the CMYK, generally CMY pro pro probably, and you've got a choice, which is great. And the nice thing is if you decide to do that, you don't have to concern yourself with chokes and spreads because even with six colors, 
the registration is essentially perfect for all intents and purposes. And that's fantastic. So we moved away pretty quick from wine. Oh, I've got to choke this, so I've got to do a spread. Of course, you've also got the clear, which adds a special effect. And we'll talk a little bit about the differences between adding clear over metallic, when you do that and why you do that, and adding clear over pure CMY. And they're different. And you've got to sort of see a difference there. So that's really cool. But with great power, great design intent, your choice above and below comes great responsibility. And how do you communicate that? Do I want this above and below? Do I want two hits of it? How do you communicate that to production? And we'll talk about that. So in line, six colors, no problems with chokes or spreads. And the other thing we've learned a lot is that the media itself really becomes almost a seventh color. And sometimes you won't even have CMYK at all. So for instance, starting on the left here, you can see that we have a nice rich red dark media. We're putting a gradient or tint of a metallic with just some clear on top. And one of the things, again, Betty alluded to this, one of the things we moved away from was to think of the metallics as a spot color like a foiler. We don't do that so much about anymore. Gradients, blends, tints gives us that power. And so here, example, we have no CMY, CMYK color at all. We're using the media to come through, adding our richness. One in the middle, black media, very, very dark media. Here we're using white in it's almost a traditional sense of a, a mask or foundation to let the CMYK gamut richness come through. And on top of that, this time, we're adding a gradient of gold. Now we can see we're using gold a bit there because gold gives us that warmness, that richness, that bronzy colors. We'll talk a lot about silver though. Silver in a way is your often your go-to color for getting the shine, the metallicization, if I can use that word to come through. So again, you can see we're using a gradient of silver from a, a mid-tone through to a, maybe a highlight and putting a CMYK on top. And what that does to us, because silver is essentially neutral, it means you can add a metallic glint, a metallic tint to any CMYK. And Xerox calls that iridescent hues or metallic hues. So that's great. In fact, you can actually make a gold out of silver um, because you can just add a little bit of Get, get a good yellow and a bronze and add, add some metallic to it. So we really branched away from thinking of metallics as just a spot and a always a foiling machine. This is more than that. So we'll talk a little bit about how we move from spot metallics all the way through to more iridescent hue type colors. Nice thing about the press as well, just quickly, the last thing really about the hardware is that by adding five or six cars, it doesn't impact production. So from a design point of view, we don't have to concern ourselves with, oh, this is really gonna hit production speed. It's in line, it works, it's fine. 400 gram, traditional press, that's not bad. It gives you folding carton work, cards. The large press size or sheet size gives you ability to have point of sale, interesting um, folding cartons, interesting impositions and a whole range of stocks beyond your standard coated, uncoated stocks. And with the newer, I think just launched uh, a month, last month, uh, they call Low Gloss Clear, really has opened up the, the world for textured, darker stocks, um, really come really good with good gamut. Uh, window decals are great, synthetics are great, um, embossed works well, again, with the Low Gloss Clear, and one thing that's not mentioned here, which we will talk a little bit about, is the use of metallic stocks for cells. You can put metallic stocks through. So if you're already using a, say, a gold and a white, and you need silver, use a silver stock. So again, stock gives you almost your seventh color. So it really opens you up. What I would say with stocks though, guys, do test, do get your print provider, um, draw and print, um, draw, draw, hoard and copy to test any special stocks. Get that working before you commit. But 
you, know, you can think beyond codes and uncoated digital stocks as long as you test it. It, 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 it. It's cool. It's cool. Any questions on that before we go on? That's good. Thank you. So what are we going to look at today? We're going to go through from how to get going quickly and simply and easily with spots and floods, almost where we started from at the beginning, how to take your four color job, quickly get an effect with a fifth color, usually a spot. We'll look at how we can then use floods with photo enhancements. Um, and really important to focus on how to identify good <coughs> candidates if you're doing some photographic work or some imagery within a document. Um, how to identify those photographic candidates that are really going to be enhanced by adding metallic or clear to them. And then we'll go all the way through to much more complex designs where we're mixing everything we've learned together and really focusing on those gradients and tints we talked about and really mixing up six colors all together and why we do things and what we found worked and what we found wasn't quite so good. All the time remembering that we can do this on a variety of media and we'll be looking at some white examples where we're using white to both as an ink in its own right and as almost like a substrate to um, act as a foundation. So we'll look at some design techniques and we'll go through, all, I say we, Bailey will help us to bring those to life um, in Creative Suite. Before we do that, I want to just share with you some of the examples we've worked on over the last year or so and why we've done what we did and things to look for. So first one's obviously gold. And I'm just going to ask Bailey if she can just talk us through a little bit of, of what's going on in this example here. So just Bailey, if you just talk us through what's happening here. Absolutely. So for this one we did, um, we had gold as the underlay and clear as the overlay. And if you'll see, um, in the disco ball panel, we are using clear um, for those rays. And since it's on CMYK, it's giving a nice shiny effect to that. Um, and you'll see we did not enhance her bathing suit or any of her jewelry with the gold. We just complemented it by using the gold um, ink with that instead of plugging it up, um, as we talked about earlier. So, and then if you see on the front, we did. Um, we multiplied CMYK over a big flood of gold um, to make a mixed um, gold iridescent hue, which is really, really neat. Um, and then we did with the shapes up in the top, you'll see some of them are 100% gold, so it's super shiny. Um, but then we use clear for some of the other shades, and you'll notice that it kind of creates a um, dull matte effect, which we'll talk about a lot in this session. Um, so clear over CMYK gives you a nice um, shiny effect and it clear over a metallic gives you um, a matte dull, duller effect, which is cool because it's pretty versatile and you can use it two different ways. Um, and you'll see on the back mailing panel, the logo we did 100% um, gold and then we multiplied the CMYK photo of the woman over the gold to create a mix iridescent um, photograph and then again with some of the clearer over the metallic so it's pretty neat it's, there's a lot of different stylistic um, options that you can do so we had a lot of fun with this one <laughs> I remember the evolution of this one Bailey as we worked through it it was great <laughs> yeah we've all we've all got the scars we've come to this which is good so thank you so much for that one of the things one of the words Bailey mentioned there was multiply we'll come back to that um and we tend to use multiply a lot and the decision of when to do an, a knockout or overprint or multiply um will 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 go through and again a good example as Bailey mentioned here with the uh, middle panel we didn't attempt to add any silver gold to the model's um swimsuit or anything it's already look look looking good thank you Bailey, for that that's cool uh, pretty obviously gold, um, great fashion catalog. Next one is very different. Um, Bailey, you could talk us through what's happening here. 
Absolutely. The good old bird postcards. All right. So <laughs> this is um, a silver underlay with a clear overlay. Um, and you'll notice that we decided to leave um, some of the content white also to create um, a lot of contrast. The back has a big um, mixed metallic flood. So we have a silver underlay and then we had a CMYK gradient over that that we multiplied to create that beautiful um, iridescent gradient. And then you'll see that we used um, clear with the, some of those geometric shapes over the flood of the, uh, the mixed metallic. Um, and it is creating that dull um, matte effect, as well as um, you'll see in the word autumn, you'll notice that there's a color change in the M. Um, and that's because half of it is on um, mixed metallic and then the darker part is on just a um, CMYK shape. So that creates that two-tone effect because some of it's dull and then some of it's shiny over the different uh, different styles. And in the bird, we put some clear over um, the white pieces in him. And just if you're always thinking in terms of contrast and how you can like, and how James said earlier, less is more, um, this is a lot of, of metallics, but it's kind of broken up with some CMYK um, and some white space too. So. Cool. Thank you, Bailey. That's really great. So the second key word that Bailey's mentioned there is contrast. And we'll come back to that. So the attempt always we've discovered is to get some contrast within the page, as Bailey said, between the areas which are metallicized, I can use that word, so the background. And for instance, the bird really stands out, not so much because it's metallic, because it isn't, or very little of it is. And it's that something we really learned. When we first did this job, I remember they looked fantastic. We had a lot of metallics all over it. It looked great on the press sheet because our eyes were contrasting it between the white of the sheet itself. Once we'd cut them out, we lost some of that contrast. So I go back to basics. How can we, within the job, and these are separate cards, add that contrast within the page itself? Thanks, Betty. That's really cool. Next one is a good example of um obviously non-white stock so Perry, can you talk us through this one i can yep so if we start in the back menu for that one we had um white in the underlay position and silver um in the overlay position and you'll notice um that we did some 100 percent silver um with the ones and uh and on the front cover some of the geometric shapes we did some different tints and um, transparencies of those to create a nice um, nice dimension with that. And we mixed in some white with that. Um, you also notice that we used 100% um, or no, it was not 100%, but we used black for some of the back um, panel. And that's creating a um, cool effect. It kind of almost looks like clear or some sort of form of clear, but it's actually um, black and the black has a little bit of um, shine to it. So on the matte paper, it gave us this really, really neat effect. We multiplied those and uh, that was really neat. So, and then we did um, cyan for some of the lines and then the snacks and sandwiches. And you'll notice we used a one point rule um, and it got, um, our, our cyan to show up on this black paper because the registration is amazing on iridesce. So we put white under snacks and sandwiches and then also the lines and then we um, put cyan over it and we didn't have to choke or sweat or anything and it's perfect registration. So that was really, that's really nice as a designer to be able to do stuff like that. So, and then if we move to the front, um, we then had gold as the overlay and white as the underlay and did the same thing but you can just see how different um you can make it with the different inks it looks like a totally different menu using gold instead of the silver thank you Ben. i apologize for losing the screen there guys um dangers of being three thousand miles away so <laughs> thanks yeah thanks and thanks for you, did, you didn't you didn't um stop a beat there Betty. thank you for carrying on so yeah, no problem. Gendry, <laughs> thank you Again, guys, you can see that use of multiplies, Bailey said, both here and here to get the tints. As we can see, we started to move away from thinking everything has to be 100 percent. 
use of multipliers give you that 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 that, that, that um, uh, beautiful effect you 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 can get. Any questions on this one? Because it's quite different to the other ones. Any questions so far, guys? That's cool. Really good. Thank you. So moving on to this one, which is very different again. Can you just talk through what's happening here, Bailey. <clears throat> Oop, James, I think that I um is my I can hear you. I can hear you. Oh, that might be me. Okay, thank you for letting <laughs> me know. So I'm just, I'm yep, just gonna just gonna stop the I'm just going to stop and start that screen sharing again. Sorry about that. We've obviously got some bandwidth problems. So we've had the last week, for obvious reasons, we've had some bandwidth problems. Let's see if we can That's get that going again. <laughs> Everyone's yeah, online. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Can we see? Can you see my screen, guys? I can see it now. Thank you very much. Thank you for your patience, people. Bailey, talk us through this one. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, the dragon window claim. So this is a good example of how Iridesk can run a lot of different media. So this was window cling media, um, and we used white uh, as the underlay and gold as the overlay. So you can see you can use it um, dependent on how you need it. So this we did an opaque white, um, so you couldn't see through the cling, and then gold as the overlay. And if you um, really neat if you multiply some of um, the elements then you could get like the stained glass effect too so playing with and testing is what <laughs> testing has been our best friend so um, try some different things out uh, this one we were able to achieve some sort of like stained glass effect by having multiply so you could see through some and not through others so definitely um, test 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 and play around with your design because this one was a really cool experimental one yeah, thank you. Third great thing Bailey said today, well, lot, lots of great things, but the third thing what I want to call out is the test, test, test. So thank you for saying that, Bailey. That's really cool. Do need to test. We didn't, we didn't, I think, discover the sort of stained glass effect immediately, but again, trying it around, I think not necessarily putting white under everything. You can decide, but again, it's up to our, it's up to you to decide where you want it to be. Really cool. And the nice thing about here is this is white under depends upon the side of the window you want to be on so you can have a white over if it's a right or wrong reading depending which side you want the glass to be so and and obviously the substrate you're using and it's your choice it's really cool so the last one we want to talk through is probably the simplest possibly my favorite one so let's see if the screen will actually change it does really cool okay back onto zephyr bailey what's going on with the zephyr all right, so we started with a white media and we did silver flood everywhere. So the box is super, super shiny. We hit it um, all over with the silver. And then, uh, so silver was the underlay and clear was the overlay in this piece. And you'll notice that the um, cool tire tracks that we used as the overlay and clear, so we multiplied that graphic and you'll see that it's the super um, matte effect. And we put the Zephyr um, logo on top of that so that that didn't have any of the clear on it so this one turned out really nice with the um mat of the clear over the silver nice nice contrast between shiny and not so that one turned out really nice yeah i think it's probably my favorite one because of that simplicity and as barry said we're multiplying as good on multiply and knockout here so we don't want the clear over the zephyr so we get rid of that on the going to make sure it's not over the, the red logo and the black, but we obviously do want it on the silver. So it's a choice that we have. And it's that simple contrast between the metallic and the non-metallic and the gloss differential, which really works for us here. I really like, I really like this and we'll come back to it. So half a dozen quick snapshots there of, of why we did things the way that we did, if you excuse my turn of phrase. Let's have a look now as we start to move how we would do some of this and our, our evolution of thinking as we go into the create, creative suite. So the first guideline I would suggest, the first thing you'll see us do or see Bailey do is the use of layers. So we use layers a lot 
and we're quite strict and vigorous in our use of layers for three reasons. One is we want to communicate to production what ink we want over, what ink we want under. So we do that by the use of layers in the PDF. We also need to manage our specialty inks. It's, most of us use layers for ma ma management. It's the same here. You really want to be able to troubleshoot where is my white? What's it look like without the silver? Where is my gold? We use layers for that. And as Bay has been mentioning, we use multiply, and therefore that's a blend mode. So you need to make sure that you're blending the right way. So we'll, you'll see as we go through, we, we we're quite strict about layers. Um, and we have a naming convention at work for us. Uh, it's just a guideline, but it, but it does help us. One of the big questions we, all, we had at the beginning is how do we actually start with four color and work upwards? So I'm going to ask Bay to go through this design from four color and then we'll, 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 we'll add the design as we add extra, extra colors. Just talk through the base four color one first, Bailey, if you could. Sure, so we took this um, really pretty watercolor design and we added our white text and this is it. So your desk is awesome to think about in terms of what, um, what am I trying to say? What pieces, what designs you already have that you could add metallics to and enhance with these um, different, different inks. So what we started with, this four color piece, we had uh, magenta on the back and our watercolor on the front with our white text. So really nice, clean and simple. Um, so then we started to think about how we could add a fifth color to it. So for this one, we added clear um, geometric shapes to the top of it. And it, since it's on CMYK, they are shiny, as we've mentioned multiple times. Um, so we added them to the back as well. So that takes it up just another notch with one more color. Um, and then we started to think about adding a sixth color. So we took the same watercolor design and we really uh, blew, blew out the highlights and lightened it. Because we've also learned that darker colors over um, silver, multiplying over silver, Kind of muddy up so if we stay in more the lighter range tones um we've had a better experience with that so we we brightened up this watercolor piece and then we multiplied that over a big flood of silver um to get a mixed metallic um watercolor and then we took clear and same on the back so we um put a flood of silver under that pink we lightened it a lot um and we have this beautiful like pinky rose gold on the back so then we did clear as an overlay for this one again. Um, we picked a different pattern, but you'll notice that it does create that dull matte um, effect since it is over the metallic. So it's just three different ways to think about the same exact job. Um, and that's really, that is a really fun thing as a designer to be like, ooh, what is possible with this press? So. Cool. Thank you, Bailey. Lots of key points there, and one thing we'll come back to again, and actually Bailey alluded to it right at the beginning of this session, was to, we both talked about it, less is more. So lightening up imagery to let the silver shine through is critical, because although the CMYK inks are slightly transparent, not enough to let your silver or gold shine through. So if you really want something to shine through, lighten up what's on top. And that, that really helps. And we learned that one the hard way. Um, but let things let let things breathe is probably the key point there. Cool. So second of our guidelines, and this is getting more and more focused now as we as we steam towards how to actually do this in Creative Suite. Now the press itself is very specific on the spot color names it requires. So it will require gold with a capital G in order to image the gold. Silver, capital S, white similarly, and the same with clear. So when it sees a spot color of white, the capital W, it will actually image for white. However, you can imagine that's not very useful in the design side, especially with white and clear, because you couldn't see them. So 
in the design, we use an analog for these colors. With gold, it's simple. We use PMS 871C um, made in CMYK. So it looks gold on the screen. That's great. When it goes to our proof, the CMYK proofer or an RGB proofer, it sort of, sort of looks gold. Um, we use PMS 877C, Pantone silver, to do the same for silver because it gives you a neutral gray. So that's great. When it comes for white and clear, it's, I can say it's not so clear. So when we design with a white spot, our analog fat is 100% cyan. That's so we can see immediately where the white is. When we proof, we can see it. When it goes to our clients for their visual proofing, they can see what's going to go white. And if we get a production proof back on the press and there's lots of cyan everywhere, we know they didn't get the white correct. So that's the way we do it. It doesn't actually matter whether you use magenta or anything for the clear, but you do need something which is an analog for those colors so that you get an impression you can proof and you can troubleshoot. So you'll see us go through that. But one last thing, the press requires these as the spot color names and you'll see us doing that. We talked about layers and another guideline, we talked about the layers as guidelines. We use layers all the time and for those reasons we discussed before. So you'll see us put the layers above or below, for obvious reasons, the CMYK, because the CMYK is fixed. You don't have a choice, but you can decide to put silver or clear, silver below or above, above gold above and below, and so on. We call the name of the layer that contains a specialty ink the same as the name of the specialty ink, and that's for ease of use. So when the PDF is opened in production, they see, ah, there's a layer called clear, they know to put clear in the overlay station. If they see a layer called silver under the CMYK, they know to put the silver under in the press because they have a choice. They have a choice. The press itself only cares about the spot color name. The layer name is immaterial to the press. We just make sure we're consistent because it helps communication. We'll see that do that a couple of times, but basically we use layers, we give them the same as the speciality inks they contain, but the press only cares about the spot color name. You'll see us do that as, as we go through. So what we're going to do is to have a look at how this works from the beginning, um, for easiest to get going uh, in nothing in design. So we're going to be looking at how to get going easily and quickly using silver in this case as a spot overlay so that's what we want to do the job itself is this one so the press sheet looks like this and you can see that we have a big area of silver a knocked out area of white and this more silver logo you can't see off the sheet down there so that's what it looks like coming off the press it's cool it's simple it works if I open the PDF, so if I'm in production or I'm in a client or under proof and I'm opening the PDF, I see a couple of things. I see the layers and we can see we have silver over CMYK. So my production department immediately knows they need to have silver in the overlay station. The press itself requires this spot color name, this spot plate called Silver Capital S. 100%, so I've probably got my cursor around about there somewhere. That's what it looks like in the PDF. I'm going to hand over to Bailey, who will take it away in InDesign and will share how we actually create that effect in Creative Suite. Thank you, James. Can you guys see my screen okay? Looks good. All righty. So for this one, since we have our silver overlay, I always start by making a new layer here. Um, and we just keep everything named the same. So capital S, silver, name our layer. And then we have to add our silver swatch. So as James mentioned before, we like to use um, 877 um, silver. Let's see. 
Here we go. So then we go in our solid coated. And I have it up here because I use it all the time. So 877C. Um, and we want to rename it to uh, be silver. We rename our swatch, keep it a spot color. And now we have our silver swatch. So then we simply take our elements and we um, cut them from the CMYK layer and then paste them onto the silver layer. Fill them with silver. And then it's good. So they're on the silver layer and they're named silver with our silver spot color. Um, so then to save these out, we actually often, um, we save a specialty color setting PDF preset. If you, and that, if you're using it a lot, that saves you a lot of time. So then you can just um, select that one. And then we get in the habit of renaming our files so that we know um, which is which. So if you click save, sure, we'll replace it. And then if you see in there, you always want for your PDF settings, Acrobat 7, um, export layers, all visible and printable layers. For compression, we do not we do not downsample. We select for each one of these. Um, for marks and bleeds, that's up to you based on your um, on your job. We want to set the color conversion or no color conversion, and then include all RGB and tag source CMYK profiles. Um, for advanced, we always want to subset fonts to 100%. And then we click save. So then if you just save that as a preset, then they'll save you time later on. Um, and then there you have it. So is there any questions on that? I do actually have a question in regards to the, the, the name Gary on there. So that's on the layer for silver. Um, but everything that's printed under it is going to be CMYK. That doesn't cause an issue with that being on the silver layer for it to print nope, white. So, I mean. Yeah, no. So that is actually going to, we didn't have to set that to knockout, but since it is white, the press knows to just keep that white and it's going to just, um, so then it, you can knock it out of there. But if we, um, since it's on top of the silver, the press will know to keep that white. Perfect. Thanks. So it makes our lives really easier. Question, we did figure, yeah, that is a really good question because we struggled with that a lot in the beginning. Like, we have to knock everything out. And um, and the more we tested, the more we figured out that um, you can carry over some of the stuff that you want on top, and the press will know to keep that white. Amazing. Yeah, I think there's also uh, some fault. Oh, you have to have a white ink. No, it's fine. It just knocks out. <laughs> it's cool. Yep. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Any other Thank questions you, on that one? Sorry, guys. It's Ali at Georgian Copy. Just a quick question. Now, that only works if that layer has not been set to overprint over the CMYK, right? Nikki, do you have any? That is correct. Right. Yeah. If you had multiplied that, then it would overprint and it wouldn't um, separate that way. If you go back to the PDF, Bailey, for a second and just look at the separations. Um, so if you do print, print production and then output preview. Here we go. Sorry, it's hiding in there. <laughs> right. So if you turn off the silver layers, or the silver ink rather, see, you'll see how that's knocking out automatically out of that CMYK. But if you had set that to multiply, then it would have overprinted. And the same is true with the text as well. I just wanted to go back on a production point for everybody that's uh, that's uh, on this right now. First of all, thank you very much for joining us. And uh, from a production standpoint, uh, the uh, the part where you put the layers named properly for what's going over and under is critical uh, for a production standpoint because that lets us schedule production and ink changeovers um, efficiently. Um, if those are not lined up properly and they're not named properly, we literally have to go into your file to figure all that stuff out. And uh, we're changing colors uh, stations left, right, and center just to achieve the same thing. So 
Thank you for pointing that out. That's a very good it. point. Yeah, cool. That's that's great. Thanks, guys. Because you're right about production efficiency. Um, although it's technically easy to change the um, color housings, it's it's not what you want to be doing every five minutes, and it just doesn't make any sense. So we, we use the layers, as we've mentioned, barely shows really to communicate the intention, and that means for production, it does make total sense. Thank you, Bailey. That's really cool. You got it. I'm going to pass it awesome. back to you, Gene. Thank no you. Yeah, this is... So, thank you, Bailey. So, you a couple of quick things as we thank you as we go forward. You can imagine a flood is essentially, from a technical point, a flood is just a um, so I'm going to, it's going to lose my screen again. I beg your pardon. I'm going to sorry guys. Going to come back in a minute. Sorry about that. A flood is basically, from a technical point of view, a flood is just a very large spot. Where the difference comes is how you really want to treat the clear. So imagine we, we looked at the zephyr. The silver was a big flood, created just like Bailey created the silver there underneath the CMYK, no difference. When it comes to clear, you really, we use floods with clear when you want to add a visual gloss, a sheen, a varnish if you want over a CMYK. So if you add a big flood of clear over some CMYK, you'll get a lovely varnish effect, but you do need to multiply. If you knock that out, of course, you have serious problems. Um, and you'll either get all magenta or you'll get nothing at all. So make sure you do multiply your clear when you do over um, your CMYK as a flood and you'll get that nice gloss. So just a point, we'll see that happen in a few minutes as well. So technically a flood is just a very large spot. But let's have a look at how we can combine those together. And so often you want to have silver and gold under, so this applies um, to have a silver and a gold in the underlay station. So we're looking at that here. And that's often a flood to keep you going to start with. And then you might want to add a spot of clear to add that differential, that gloss differential onto the page. We saw that as we mentioned with the Zephyr and Bailey took us through that. Again, I'll just say it once more that over a metallic, the clear gives you a dull varnish over a CMYK gives you a gloss varnish and that can be on one page or on different jobs. So take a look and it's really cool. You're always aiming for visual contrast um, and for your graphic to pop to give that wow effect. So all the time use that, 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 that idea of, of a three-dimensional effect if, if you want or gloss differential using those, those five or six colors. Now we talked a little bit about spots and it's 100% and I mentioned at the beginning one of the things we started to play a little bit with was the use of tints. So we can see here that and the same is true for uh, clear as well as metallics. So it doesn't have to be 100%, it can be 75, it can be 50, gives you even more chance of doing a, an interesting gloss differential or metallic diff differential. So start to think beyond just a big spot a big hundred percent. The next one we're going to look at where we're doing that underlay of a flood overlay of a spot with silver under clear over is a photographic example. So again we're looking for visual contrast. Also Bailey will talk us through why we chose this example. So when it comes off the press you can see immediately we have lovely areas of deep rich yellow. We have you'll see some beautiful areas of metallicized grey and it's a gorgeous image. You might have this, I'm, I'm sure George and Cobb might have a sample of this to, to copy, show, show with you at some point. Looks great, it comes off the press, absolutely go gorgeous. When you open it as a PDF, it's a bit of a shock or surprise. Mm -hmm. A couple of things you'll see. One is it's very dark because imagine what we're doing, we're adding a whole flood of silver here. Here's our silver layer. On an RGB screen, it just means there's less and less light, so it looks very dark. If you proof it, it's going to look really dark, but it shines 
when it's really silver. So that's the first thing, be careful of proofing on the screen. The other thing you'll notice is the magenta everywhere. That's our analog for clear, so we can troubleshoot. If we just kept it as clear with nothing, you wouldn't see anything at all. So for troubleshooting, for proofing, or sharing with, with your clients, the analog will come in. So it's key to keep your layers going. So you can see here we've got clear over silver. So the intention to production is obvious. And for the press itself, it's looking for those spot color names, uh, silver and clear. You can see my cursor's probably round about here somewhere. So we've probably knocked out the silver and got a little uh, a, a tint, a 9% tint of clear. So the screen here looks very odd, very strange. I'm going to hand back over to Bailey again, who will take us through this in InDesign, I think Photoshop, and show us how we made this up. Perfect. To you. Thank Bailey. you. So I want to start off by showing you um, the CMYK photo that we started with. Um, and we chose this piece uh, or this image because if you notice the contrast is extreme. Um, the clouds in the back highlights are super blown out um, and that allows for the silver that we put underneath this to really show through um, how I mentioned earlier lighter colors let that metallic um, pop through more than the darker um, and then the siloed uh, yellow calves allowed for us to keep some of that CMYK um, so you'll see as you saw for James's example this is very different from at the start than what we uh what we ended up with and if you could get your hands on a sample of this it's really um one of our favorite pieces because it turned out really really well so let me pop into the file um whoops, whoops. all of it's coming up all right so <laughs> if we <laughs> surprise if we open up our layers you'll notice we start from the bottom and work um our way up but you'll see so again for production purposes, um, silver's under, CMYK, and then clear on top. We just get in the habit of naming everything the same and labeling our layers, keeps everyone in order. So if we open up what's under here, so you'll notice our um, base layer is this flood of silver. You'll see that the cabs that we um, punch, we everything that we wanted to keep the MYK um, because we don't want that multiplying over the silver because we wanted them to keep their CMYK um, CMYK ness is what I wanted to say but that's not a word um, it must be the it must be the social distancing <laughs> and we hit them with um, on top here so you'll notice and now we're back to where James showed it so I want to show you um, how exactly we did this base layer. So I'm going to open up um, this guy in Photoshop here. Photoshop. So this is a monotone image. So what we did, we passed out the clock, um, inverted it, and then deleted those so that we were left with just our silver flood. And we went up to image mode and zero tone. And what you'll see is that we selected the 877C for this and filled it with a silver, named it silver. Oops, gotta make sure I'm naming correctly. So that all passed your file. So the press will see this, even if it's your Photoshop file, it'll map that um, in your InDesign file. So if you save that, it comes in. Layer. So then what we did for the CMYK, we took the CMYK and you'll notice that we multiplied it over um, over the silver. So that gives us that mixed metallic um, background. And then the clear, we had passed those out um, in Photoshop as well because we only wanted to hit the cabs with the clear. We didn't want to get that full matte effect over the mixed metallic that we created. Um, so that, that is a pretty neat example. Any questions on this one? It is an intense um, file, but it's really neat to see how you can manipulate photos to get metallics in there. 
Bailey, can I just chime in for a second? Yep, please do. Sure. Can you show, um, can you expand that CMYK layer for one second? Yep, I just want to um, point out that there are two CMYK files on this layer. So if you could turn off that base one for a second, Bailey, the bottom one, you'll see that the cab selection is left as a separate file um, because if you turn that top one off and turn the bottom one back on, Bailey, we are multiplying only that city background image over the silver the other image that has contains just the cabs and the clock only is left as normal and is printing in cmyk only so having that cmyk with the clear over that giving it that gloss effect and then having that iridescent background with the silver underneath is really creating this cool dimensional effect with the background and then the cabs um, the contrast that's creating there Thanks, very Nikki. Good. Yeah, very good. Thanks, Nikki. Any other Any questions on this one? That's good. Thank you so much for that. Again, Betty, that's really cool. So I'll pass yeah, that. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. So that was a so this colour job, big flood of silver and underlay with a clear over. But that again was essentially 100% silver. So let's take a look at the next step, which is to start to look at creating these, being in control of creating these iridescent hues. In other words, we're going to start to be using tints of under and the tints of the over. So the job we're going to look at is our friend the polar bear and this is very similar in terms of technique to the bird postcards we looked at right at the beginning so this one is just wonderful uh, it's been used from around the world now as a magazine cover for i think it's the para mag magazine it's very much a bespoke design we'll come back to why i'm saying that a little bit later it's made up of a number of elements lots of elements but still essentially just a silver cmyk and the clear. So that's what it looks like. It shines and pops, and the bear actually looks three dimensional. When we look at it in PDF, you can see we have a silver spot and a clear spot. My cursor's here, and you can see that it's just a 50% silver. So, kind of more towards we're talking about the less is more and the control of the tints. And again, we're not putting a very dark amount of. That's just a little bit of magenta and a mid-tone of cyan on top of there. You'll notice we haven't shown you the layers panel because this is where we broke our guidelines. Because of the complexity of the job, we had to use a number of layers. But the press doesn't care. That's all flattened in the front end, in the rip the fari front end. All we need to concern ourselves is that we have the spot color names correct. Because remember, layers are just for our benefit and for getting our blending modes correct. So that's what it looks like in the PDF. It's beautiful, it prints fantastic. Go hand back over again to Bailey, who will take that away in Illustrator this time because of the complexity of the file. All righty. So I want to start out by showing you guys um, what we started out with. So this was our CMYK art. Um, and then we looked at him and we we're like, hmm, how can we add metallics and how can we add clear to this? So as you'll see over here, um, the snowflakes we start and the snowflakes and the waves, we started out um, as a blue and then we changed those to clear to add our um, nice matte finish for those little cute elements. Um, we did a flood of silver underneath. So this is silver under, clear over. We have our silver flood. Um, and then you'll notice that we started with the blue sky and we just deleted that um, color and had that be full silver. And then our water was beautiful um, blue gradient. So we took that and we multiplied that over the flooded silver here. Um, and then for the polar bear, we decided that rather than keep him all CMYK, kind of similar to what we did with the birds to add a lot of contrast to him, um, we left some that was uh, full silver. We did mixed metallics with some of these geometric shapes. Some we left white, so we really uh, 
really utilized our silver um, in our mixing here. Um, so let's get into the file. So like James said, this was one that we kind of broke our own rules of um, having strict like an underlay layer and an overlay layer um, because it was just too crazy. And that goes back to the question earlier about, well, the, the word Gary was on top. So you can cheat the system a little bit is how we like to say it. You know, if, it, if it's making your life easier and it's going to get the job done, um, it's going to work the same. But just keep in mind those layers do keep you honest um, in your design. So as we've mentioned, let's start from the bottom and build this little guy up. My little polar bear man. So we did a legit just flood of silver underneath. And then we added our first CMYK layer. And you'll notice that we multiplied um, here the gradient so that that became a nice mix metallic. So this is what's cool with your desk. You can create your own mixed metallics, right? Um, just, you don't have to follow by the rules. You'll see a little bit later that there are, there are other options with swatches. But um, I like to design with creating my own because I can start with whatever art I want. Um, so then, so we kept some of these as full CMYK, and then you'll notice that we added a, another silver layer, so we didn't have to punch that out of our gradient. We mixed up the different uh, tints of them to add more dimension. And then the second CMYK layer that we added was uh, to mix those uh, hues. Rather than keep those strict CMYK, we wanted to add some mixed metallics into the polar bear, so we just to make our life easier, added a CMYK second layer. And then we finished him up with our little clear uh, snowflakes and our waves. And you'll notice every time we use clear, um, and you'll see it in here, this is set to multiply. So every time you use clear, you want to set it to multiply. So the press will do um, what it needs to do correctly. So he was really fun, and he's utilizing a lot of use of multiply um, and mix mixed hues. So any questions on him? Thank you, Bailey. You got it. Really cool. Really cool. All right, let me pass back to you, James. All about passing the screen back and forth today, I think. <laughs> Gotta work on my dribble skills though. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So <laughs> Bailey said a very important point there that um, she really likes to do her own mixed metallics or iridescent hues because of experience Bailey has. She knows, I'm talking on your behalf here, Bailey, that 37% of cyan over 22% of with 20% magenta over 46% uh, silver gives you the colour that she wants. But that's after four or five years' experience. So that's very difficult to, to do at the beginning. So what Xerox has done to simplify matters and to get going quickly is to create a series of predefined swatches. And they're available for gold and for silver. And they are using predetermined amounts of 60% gold, 60% silver at either 20 or 12.5% increments of CMY. Uh, no K, because you don't really need K for this. So that means that if you can use those in exactly the same way as you would do the Pantone swatch book. So you can print them out, they're available as a PDF and they can be distributed to yourselves as designers by um, your press, your print provider. You can look at these both on the PDF screen and the printed copy and you can decide with uh, your clients that maybe gold 87 is the color that you want, exactly the same way as you would with a um, Pantone swatch book. You can then load these as swatches in InDesign, and we'll be sending out links to those at the end. You can then use those in your design, knowing, predicting exactly what the color is you're going to get. So it's short cutting Bailey's four or five years experience, and predicting what you're going to get in exactly the same process as you would with a Pantone swap, swatch book. So what do we mean by that? Let's look at this example where we have some cards. You can see my cursor's in the middle here, and we've coloured in the design and the text 
and you can see we're using 6% gold and that mid-tone is really where you want to be aiming for and that's why the Xerox swatch is at 6% gold and it's a 20% magenta and 100% yellow. That gives us that sort of nice deep rich colour. If I stick over to here you can see that wow this has just not gold at all. However, it is still got a 6% gold, so it's got a 20% cyan on top. So in terms of the screen, it, it looks almost like a silver. You know you can predict what you're going to get because you've got the printed copy in front of you, just like you would a Pantone swatch book. To get away from having to rely on visualising italics on RGB screen, which you, you can't do. It's impossible. So use of swatches is great. It gets you going, takes some of the unpredictability away and, and as you get more experience you can say decide actually maybe 55 percent gold is okay but you can base your own swatches on these ones here so i'm going to pass back over to bailey again who will show us how to import those swatches into indesign how to e easily easily use them in a design so back over to you again bailey perfect all right so the magic swatches is what I like to call them. So as James was mentioning, you can choose to mix your mix your own metallics or the, these magic swatches. Super fun. So what you do um, if you're in InDesign, you go into um, your swatches palette. You go down to load swatches here, and then it's another InDesign file, and you do open. And look at that, voila. We have all of these mixed metallic colors. That's what I'm telling you, it's magic. So the cool thing about this is that if you have, um, you know, you have to match whatever, you can look at the swatches palette and get a close representation without having to mess around with what what tin of, of gold, what tin of, of uh, CMYK. So another cool thing is that you can kind of fake other colors. So, um, you know, you can pick a color that looks silver-ish without having the silver toner in your in your press. Um, so these are all always really, really fun. And if you're in, you know, sometimes if you're in a hurry and you just want to look at the swatch sheet and be like, ooh, yep, that's exactly the color I need. Um, there is a bajillion of them in here. Um, so we always like to have people have these because it makes everyone's life super easy um so yeah so those are the swatches cool simple as that they're very simple to use they work well and when we send out the email there'll be a link to the InDesign originals so that you can use them straight away in your designs any questions before we move on to that Cool. Thank you, everyone. All right. Coming at you, James. Thank you. So we've talked a lot about metallics. Um, we haven't talked about white very much. So let's talk a little bit about, about white and the different use cases for white. Now, you'll notice I've got, on this case, white ticked both as an underlay and as an overlay. And that's because often you may want, occasionally you may want to do a double hit of white. If you do need a double hit of white and your print provider has white, two white housings, they can do that in a single pass. Um, let's look at both those cases, why you want white under and white over. So white under on the sample here is where you're wanting to add as a base layer for your CMYK to sit on top of a very dark stock or metallic stock. That lets the gamut of the CMYK shine through. White, of course, can be an overlay, in which, which case white is an ink in its own right. So you're actually writing with white, as it were. So let's have a little look at that. So we mentioned double or single hit, and you may ask why we want to do that. White is a single hit, will give you a slightly less opaque white. So some of that color of the media will shine through. And that's maybe what, what you want. That may be cool. If you want a more opaque white, so that white is really white, 
then that can be hit twice. From a design point of view, there are no implications. As long as you've specified white, all the print production has to do is either run the job through twice, which has a slight implication on productivity and registration. But if they have two white colour housings, then it runs through in a single pass and you get the two hits of white. So that's just a choice you have. But from a design point of view, you don't have to care. You just have to print white. So that's white as an ink in its own right. White can also be used as an underlay. And we saw an example earlier on where we were putting white as a base on a transparent cling for the design on top. And it's pretty obvious why you want to do that, so that you've got some control over what shines through and what doesn't. Example on the right hand side was originally where we have the design on a metallicized, very shiny, glossy stock. So the skin tones were just fantastic and it was beautifully smooth and gorgeous when we move the design to a slightly um a mottled um and slightly darker paper stock we put white under to make sure that the skin tones are preserved and found that actually that had an impact on some of the smoothness um so we use white as an under and now with the um newly released uh, low gloss clear you could add a low gloss clear on top of that to get back to that nice smoothness again. So white can be used as in this, these cases as an underlay to let the, the gamut and the density of the ink um, shine through. So two cases for white. What we're going to look at is this one here. So we're going to get to look through here. So we have a point of sale, I guess, or a some sort of takeaway. And this was a fashion piece so we really wanted the media to be the selling point so it's a black suit so we wanted the black stock to sell the cloth so we didn't want to do this in white in black ink because we wanted the black media to be the selling point so we're going to use white here as the text and some of the infill so it's very different so if it's white here is the ink in its own right on a black the beautiful black coated media. Looks lovely if it comes off the press. When I open it in PDF, I see a number of things immediately. I see cyan everywhere because remember that was my analog for white. So the same as I use magenta for clear, I'm using cyan for white. You can see why we have to do that, otherwise you'd never find your white text simply. You'll also see that the imagery is essentially reverse video. And we'll show they will show us why we do that. But there's no CMYK at all in that print. So the print itself, the blackness you see here is the media. The information, the text, and the infill is the white here. So you can see the cursor is probably around about here somewhere, and I'm getting a 12% white. You've only got a white layer with no CMYK whatsoever. That's the PDF. I'm going to hand back over to Bailey, I think for the last time, where they will take us through this in InDesign and in Photoshop, I think. Perfect. Thank you very much. This piece is one of my favorites um, because it's not something that you instantly think of to do with white, um, but it turned out so beautifully. And we printed it on that nice sharp black stock, and we also um, did like a midnight sparkly blue, which was really, really sharp as well. All right, so let's build this bad boy. So let's, um, this can be white, add our white layer, and then let's add our white swatch. So we're gonna want it to be a spot color, 100% cyan. Let's rename it white like we've been doing. Um, and I'm actually going to go ahead and create our text in white and then also make our logo white. And then if we go to the link palette and we open up our suit image into Photoshop. All right. So you'll see it's just our black and white photo and we want to go to image mode grayscale. It already is grayscale. So that is done and done. And we open up Duotone. 
So I have it in here as a silver. Let's just if we make this set to bear with me one second. Default. We're going to make it 100% cyan. So that's what we're mapping our white to. And then we're going to name it white. There and then we're gonna go to. Uh, oh, hold on. Let me select my layer. Uh oh, Nikki, what is it? Invert. It's image. image. Uh, yep, under image. Image. There we go. I'm sorry, I always lose it. <laughs> under adjustments. Adjustments invert. Thank you so much. <laughs> you got it. So then <laughs> we have our inverted image, and we go ahead and save that. file, save it as our white, beautiful. And then what we can do, cool, excellent, over saved it. Yep, but, so then you would bring it in and then you have all of your white on your white layer and that's gonna print and leave the black paper anywhere that the white is. So that's really, really neat and a different way to think about your photograph. Any questions on that? Cool, thank you, Betty, All that's right. really great. So really simple way of getting an amazing effect. And You'll notice that I think you save that as a PSD. Um, that can be an EPS as well. It doesn't really matter. That white still comes through. So PSD or EPS will still preserve that white spot color from Photoshop all the way through to InDesign. Thanks, Bailey. If you could pass that back you to me. Got it. Yeah. Cool, thank you. So that's how we did the cling, for instance. So we have that big white background. Um, the whole thing there in the cling, as an example, was done in, I guess, Illustrator, I would think. You'll see this example, I've got, we've got these step-by-step -step guides. So everything that Bailey's talked about, we've discussed, is gone through on a step-by-step -step basis in the design guide that we'll be referencing and um, with the email that comes out. So. You have to remember, uh, write everything down. We've actually gone through and showing you step by step of what to do. If you have not actually created the white in this case in InDesign, by bringing that PSD or EPS in, it will automatically bring that spot color in for you as well. So you wouldn't have to recreate it in InDesign. It just depends on your workflow and where your original comes from. Okay, let's have a look at a couple of additional insights before we finish off. So one of the things Bailey mentioned right up front, which we learned the hard way, I'll tell you that now, was adding metallic, in this case gold, to a four-color image that already looks great in four colors as a metallic, doesn't add anything. It'll just actually make it look much darker and block up you'll end up the whole thing looking like, I think your word was mud, I think. So if it looks great, usually with jewelry, special effects, clothing, anything that looks good in silver and gold, leave well alone. And as Bailey said, use the metallic inks to add design text, any other parts of the page to complement what already looks good. You might, for instance, add some clear to some of these bubbles here to make some di some differentials. So that's one we learned the hard way. I'll tell you that now. We talked about the swatches and we mentioned they were available in InDesign. And the reason for that is it's very simple to create them in InDesign and they're using a ink set called Mixed Inks, which is a, a color mode that's only available in InDesign. So they're not using uh, swatches that can be bought into Illustrator. So if you do wish to make a swatches in Illustrator or make up special specialty colors, you can use the swatch book to determine the mixtures you want, 60, 20, 100, and then you can build your own swatch directly in InDesign. But you can't import them directly in, sorry, in Illustrator. You can 
print them out, look at them, and then just add them into Illustrator as a, a, as a separate swatch. Final takeaway, which um, our friends from George and Copy have already said was, and we've already said a lot, is that a good working relationship between the design and production is critical. We were very lucky um, in the Zillet Group because we were physically close, uh, 20 minutes away, I think, from the Xerox Research Labs. And so we worked with them, we were able to go and test things. But you do need to test the assumptions, um, especially at the beginning. So do, do get really close to the production group and they're great. It is a digital press. So as long as production allows, you can do on, on much easier to do on print proofs. Uh, but you can't proof this on the screen and you can't proof this on your RGB inkjet, however many colors it's got. So, so do get really close to your production guys. Talking of whom, there are some things you can do that are possible in production that you don't need to go back to the design for. So if you are, have designs that you think, oh, this could really benefit, but I, I really haven't got time or haven't got these, the, um, uh, I don't, don't have the source files, you can actually do quite a lot of work in the front end itself. So let's talk a little bit about this. So clear is a good example. You might have an example like this, where I want to add a little bit of clear over this guy here to add some shine. But because he has this three-dimensional skin, I can say, well, actually, I'd really like that to stand out. And it's possible in the press to actually run this through up to seven times. And that will actually give a physical, a tactile layer where you put the clear. So if you put the clear as a design once, in production, they can run that through. It's a manual process, but it can be put through up to up to seven times, and that adds a really three-dimensional effect to the output. But you don't have to put seven layers of clear. You can do it once. Other things you can do at the front end. We've talked about double hit. Double hit of white is the most usual in design. You specify it once to tell production to run it through twice. It's possible to do a double hit of silver and gold, but only up to twice. I don't think we found a case, a use case for that yet, but it's possible. Some people have said you can actually hit a Pantone silver a little bit closer, but I, I haven't seen that. More useful is if you have designs you want to very quickly get going with um, some of the speciality inks. So you might, for instance, already have designs in PDF with 877C or 871C or a spot color varnish. Um, in production, they can automatically, at the front end, call out any of the speciality colors and link them to one of the spot colors. So that can be done automatically at the front end while you get the designs ready yourself. It's possible, say, on a design to make all the text silver, and that can be done again at the front end at the press. So you can get going, see what it looks like before you go back and get into the, de into the design stage. It's also possible using a feature called the Image Enhanced Visual Editor, which sits at the rip at the um, Fari front end, to go in and say, I want the image on page six. Please add the clear to the highlights. That's possible. It depends on production, it depends on whether that's a skill set that that, 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 that that operator has. It's possible to do that. Usually useful if you don't have access to the original source file. Lastly, very useful is the ability to automatically at the press add white under all printable areas. So again, get you going very quickly. If you haven't got access to the source file, you've got some specialty media, white under everything, print it on a cling film and it, get, it gets you going quickly. And then you can go back into the source file and add it more subtly um, at a lay, lay, later date. Ooh. So, thank you so much for listening, guys. That's been really great. We are available to help any further, and I'm sure that um, my colleagues at George and Copy will be talking to you guys about all, all of this as we go through. So, if you do need to um, ask for any help about special about identifying specialty candidates, about running open shops, any specialty techniques, please talk to. Uh, Georgian and Xerox and if needs be they can come back to us and we can run some special sessions or some one-to-ones we're available to do that through 
Xerox, because we've talked about a lot here, and a lot of that needs to be absorbed in and, and, and tested. As we said at the beginning, we were sending out a email which will come out, which will have a link not only to the recording of this video, but also some other videos which are available um, on Xerox.com and also on the Iridesc channel in YouTube. Go through some of the specialty techniques that Bailey has mentioned um, step by step uh, outside of this session. There's also the design guide, which I'd really recommend if you haven't got hold of it. Uh, grab a copy uh, either from xerox.com or from the email that goes out and that goes through as we mentioned earlier step by step um, how to do some of these tech techniques and then you've got some basis to get you going quick quick quickly and lastly really aimed probably more at our friends at georgian copy than the design group here but essentially xerox i understand we were asked to pass this on is has a special deal for 2020 uh, buy three special items, get one free, if I can say that. Uh, so white, silver, gold or clear, limited 10 items, uh, lesser value one goes free. Uh, I'd grab that because they're, um, if you're using an awful lot of silver, and we, you can see we use silver a lot, probably worth investing at this point to, to get, the, um, get the deal there. Any last questions before we say thank you and sign off? Anything we've talked about, anything not clear, anything that we can help with at this point? Cool, so thank you very much everyone. And from myself, thank you very much and enjoyed and um on behalf of nikki and bailey thank you as well yes thank you guys so much thank you bye bye thank you bye. thanks so much guys. Bye. great job thank you great job. thank you very much cheers nice guys and, and thank, thank you very you. much everybody and be safe yeah Peace keep out. safe Peace out. Peace out. Cheers. Yeah. bye 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 bye